fabulous show. Alaska. I heard Alaska. It's hard. <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. You can hear it from Sitka to Faro. Gather around for Jeannie's show. It's the alley. Everyone and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Native Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so very much for joining me. And it's a pleasure to bring you today's program. We travel north to Barrow, Alaska, home of the Inupiat people, home of the whalers of the north. My grandfather, by the way, Tony Jewell, was the last whaler in Point Lay, Alaska to capture a bowhead whale. He was a whaling captain, so the tradition runs through my veins. I love this program, not only for that reason, but because we're able to share the excitement, the drama, the intensity, and the event that brings together a whole village to not only capture the whale, get it on shore, but to share and celebrate the event as well. Heartbeat Alaska is made possible by Kupik Carlisle Transportation, your full-service transportation and logistics company. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. Now we head out to the Chukchi Sea, where one of the crews has just landed a 60-ton bowhead whale. Welcome to Chukchi Copy, Copy Mobile. We need help to board it up. It's Sunday morning, June 1st at 11 a.m. in Barrow, Alaska. VHF signals carry the urgent message from a whaling crew out on the ice. Straight down from UIC parent office? Okay, we got two guys heading down there. And also like cell phones in a city. Residents here in Barrow rely upon the VHF as a source of communication. By now, half the town knows that one of the whaling captains has caught a whale and needs as many hands as possible to help pull it up on the ice. The whaling crew's flag has been perched on the tallest piece of ice, signifying a successful hunt and marking the location of the harvest site. As soon as news hits town, a smaller flag is put on the rooftop of the captain's house, letting all those in town know that a whale has been caught and whose crew caught it. One by one, people show up at the site on snow machines and by whatever means necessary, ready to work and work hard. Go! The whale, a 56-foot female bowhead whale, will take a while to get up on the ice and even longer to butcher. Captain of the crew, Henry Kignick, has his work cut out for him. Henry will have to determine how this whale will be brought up on the ice, especially with as few people as there are present. Another block and tackle is hooked up. 
This should make pulling the whale up on the ice a little easier. The bowhead whale can often weigh in excess of 60 tons, and that requires a sturdy piece of ice that will support that much weight. Fortunately, the captain has chosen a sturdy piece of ice. It's now just a battle of physically getting the whale up on the ice. Snow machines are added to the mix, along with a few new recruits. Inch by inch, the whale slowly comes out of the icy waters. Keep in mind that what's showing at the present is only about a quarter of the whale. They keep us busy all night. You've seen it out there, it was. They never stop. Sometimes they get tired, you know it. It's a lot of work. Sometimes they take a nap out there when they get a little too tired, you know. It gets it to you, but you know, you gotta be strong to, to do the job. You gotta finish the job. And no matter what we do, I have to thank the Lord for giving us strength. I will provide, I will provide what we need the most, and we we'll share it with the people. The decision has been made to start cutting up the beach part of the bowhead, harvesting what's available, and lightening their load for their next attempt at pulling the whale up on the ice. The whale skin and blubber, or muktuk, as it's known in the Inupiaq language, are cut into long, strip-like portions that are easy to carry, or should I say drag. Long hooks are inserted into the muktuk, allowing the hookers to pull on the muktuk so that cutting the blubber away from the body of the whale can be done much easier. In this case, there is only enough room on the ice for a couple of cutters. The whale will need to be pulled up further on the ice before several cutters can participate. That way. When the muktuk is cut away from the whale, it is dragged to a different part of the ice where others load it into sleds to be hauled to the shore. As you can see, it takes the cooperation of many to make such a feat possible.
Many of the people here today are from Barrow's different whaling crews or members of the captain's family. Others are residents who have chosen to take time away from their busy lives to help Henry and his crew. Regardless of their relations, each one of these people will be rewarded for their hard work with a share of maktak and meat. It takes so much patience, hard work, and dedication to take part in the harvest of a whale that just getting the task done is reason to celebrate, and so they do. When a crew catches their first whale, it's divided amongst all the 51 whaling crews of Barrow. The whaling captain gets his portion, and then each crew in Barrow gets a portion of that whale. All those who help with the harvest get a portion of the whale, and yet another portion goes to serving the community in what is known as Nagikai. Unalik means come on over and have some fresh muktak. That's how I learned it, and that's how they still refer to it today. Unalik Nagikai is just one of the feasts they celebrate during whaling season. Another feast is known as the Eskimo picnic or Apawalti. It's a tradition that we follow through and bring in the whaling boat on shore after a successful season and we put out a little feed for the community members, whoever comes down. We uh, serve them our delicacy, our mikiyak. And it, it's an uh, event that occurs during this time of the year, this time of the season after a successful hunt, the men coming back on shore. From a mile away, the crew pushes their flag-bearing umiak from the icy waters of the Chukchi Sea to the shore, where they are greeted by their community. has been given, Mikiak is served to those who brave the wind and cold to be part of this joyous occasion. Hi, my name is Rebecca Brara. I'd like you to, I'd like to welcome you to Barrow. Here's the first apparati, and this is what you call Mikiak. It's muktik and meat cut up and rendered. So, it's very delicious. It's delicious. Very delicious. So I'm serving my second round here. Oh. Hello. Hello. This is bowhead part, the bobber, and some meat. Right here. We call it fermented, fermented whale. Big mm. When the muktuk and meat are harvested, much of it is placed in buckets and soaked in the blood of the whale. It is stirred two to three times a day for a week or more until the meat and muktuk have become fermented. It is considered a delicacy and is extremely popular amongst the Anubak people. He is, he is, he is the country eating Mickey up. <laughs> He's out, active. <laughs> one of these kind. He had one of these kind. He's all active. Oh, no. Yeah, I know. This Apawauti is being held in honor of Harry Brower Jr. and his crew, the little Kupak crew, who have already caught the whale for the season. For Harry, it's time to retire the umiak and start getting ready for Nulakatak, the blanket toss, which is another celebration these people have during the summer. One, easy, two, three, go! Coming together for a feast is the way Anukbak people celebrate life, a reminder to be thankful for what they have and appreciate what they have been taught by their elders about life in the frozen land. Ukbiavit.
It is the most northern community in the United States. Although this Alaskan community sits at the top of the state, it has come to be known as the top of the world. To the indigenous people who have dwelled here since time immemorial, the area is known as Ukbiavik. The place where owls are hunted. To the rest of the world, the area is known as Barrow, named after Sir John Barrow, the second secretary of the British Admiralty. Traditionally, an Inupiaq Eskimo village, Barrow has grown in size over the years and is now home for over 4,400 people, with approximately 64% of the population being Alaska Native or part Native. Located on the shores of the Chukchi Sea, Barrow is the economic center of the North Slope Borough. The economy of Barrow is largely dependent upon tax revenues from the North Slope oil fields. Many residents are employed by the North Slope Borough and the many businesses that provide support services to oil field operations. Being located on the Chukchi Sea has both its benefits and downfalls. Fish, walrus, seal, birds, and whales are easily accessible to these Anubak people. But at the same time, the fierce winds and pounding waves of the Chukchi Sea take their toll on this coastal community. All these are sandbags from um, last fall. Every fall, all the waves get really big and start taking out the road here and the beach. and they North Slope Borough put in these sandbags to help the erosion problem that's been going on in Barrow for the past, ever since I can remember. There used to be a real big hill right here where I used to go sledding when I was a little kid. And they used to go all the way to the water where the ice is. The beach used to go out about another 50 feet, 75 feet maybe. But every year the waves get really big and take out the roads, start taking out the coastline. And they got to move those houses every, every about eight to 10 years. This road's currently closed, right? Yeah, this road's currently closed, unless you got a good four by. Even with the erosion problem that is not exclusively here in Barrow, but is also prevalent in many of the coastal villages along the Chukchi and Bering Seas. The people here are able to adapt to the changes that occur in Barrow, including the influx of visitors who come here each year. During the summer, tourism provides a large boost to the economy as sightseers come from thousands of miles to get a taste of life in the far north and catch a glimpse of the midnight sun. In fact, the Anupiat Heritage Center in Barrow offers the experience of a lifetime for hundreds of tourists each year. Inside the center, you will find artifacts that date back as far as 500 AD. Relics that were once tools for everyday life and songs and dances that are still very much a part of the life for these Anupiat people today. Songs and dances are stories and lessons that have been passed down from generation to generation and continue to be passed on today. Within the movements of these dances, stories are being told. Some songs tell the lessons learned about sharing and working together.
each song and dance has a meaning that in one way or another is directly related to the Anubiak way of life. This game right here is called Anubiak of Death. And long ago, especially in the sod homes, we play this game. We would anchor one end of the game onto the floor and attach the other one onto the roof. <laughs> and also long ago, this piece of bone was very small. Also had a very small pin hole. Also, our spears had a very sharp piece of bone ivory. The object of the game is to get your spear into the hole first. At the Inupiat Heritage Center, visitors also learn about different native games like this you one. Go again. You make it a little longer than that. <laughs> yep. so, yeah. you got a in or again. One more. One more. Again, you do it three times. Dominique. That's <laughs> All visitors can learn about the traditional clothing of the Inupiaq people, what kind of animal fur is used, where the animal is hunted, and how the furs are sewn into clothing. It's a brief but informative visit that opens up the eyes of many visiting tourists, giving them a little insight to the power and pride of the Inupiaq way of life. Lifelong resident Lloyd Levitt explains. Barrow is a very close-knit community, that much I know about Barrow. I was born and raised right here in Barrow. And a lot of it is based on unity when, whenever we do our hunting traditions and wherever we go, it's based all on unity. Without unity, there we really can't succeed by ourselves. That's what I believe in. It's a belief that is instilled in the Anupak people from birth, the glue that bonds them together. Traditionally, when a problem or issue would arise within a village, the elders would get together and find a solution to the problem. It is this kind of unity and ability to work together that is still practiced today that deserves a respect of cultures from around the world. Flying in Alaska? Fly Frontier, the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier is expanding again. They've added new routes to Nome, Kotzebue, and the surrounding villages. As you can see, Frontier is now really covering Alaska. So the next time you fly, try Frontier. Frontier offers quick, convenient check-in, low fares, and service direct to many of the villages. Frontier Flying Service is the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Make it your official airline, too. If you visit Barrow in the summertime, it can be hard to sleep with that 24-hour sunshine. So, the King Eider, Barrow's newest hotel, does everything to make your stay quiet, relaxing, and worry-free. Don't worry about a cab. The King Eider is a short walk from the airport. Need to get around town? No problem. The King Eider rents cars. Want a room with a kitchenette? The King Eider's got them. Smoke-free, alcohol-free, it's the hotel so clean, they ask you to take your shoes off when you come in the door. The King Eider Inn, Barrow, Alaska. Why do you stare at the mountain top, Anna? The mountain tells you the early sign of a storm. How does the mountain speak? When you see small clouds at the top, it's saying there will be a storm. Life speaks too, like our ancestors. Look for sign in nature. We can look for early sign of a breast cancer. Call your healthcare provider today for a screening appointment. Early detection can save your life. In the 1890s, pioneers carved a railway through the rugged mountains between Skagway and the Klondike. More than a century later, the White Pass and Yukon route still makes this legendary run. Along the way, life has gotten better for folks working on the railroad, thanks in part to Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska, a health plan that's offered smart choices and quality coverage to the people of Alaska since before it was a state. Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. We're here. We're with you. Even after the whale is on the ice and butchered, the work is just beginning. You see it in everyday life around these parts. Family members and friends helping out when an extra hand is needed. You especially see it when it comes to whaling season. Pulling a whale up onto the ice is no easy chore. It takes a great deal of manpower and tremendous support from the shore. 
A large amount of responsibility belongs to the wife of the captain, the captain's family, and the families of crew members as well. When news of a crew getting a whale hit the town, the captain's wife gets busy. Preparation for Nrikai and the Apawauti have begun. We're all already thinking, okay, you need to have some uh, flour for the donuts. You need to think about the crew that's bringing it in. They're going to be hungry. So main thing is you make some soup, something they can eat um, when they get to shore or down there. And you also think about um, those who help towing and those who help cut up. Up here, I worry about, um, you know, fruit that's going to be served as well as um, getting the pots and the stoves ready. Um, <clears throat> and how well you get this, your house ready. You know, you could cover it up if you want because there'll be a lot of traffic in and out. And generally you can cover it with cardboard for the next few days. Back in the ice, the people are slowly but surely making progress with the whale. More of the community has come out to help get this huge bowhead up on the ice. But now, concerns are focused on the west wind. When the wind changes, west wind, that's when the ice starts coming in. Right now, we want, we want to try and get east winds or let the wind pick up stronger so it can, so it can blow, out. blow away. The huge ice flow that has been drifting by them for the past few hours has changed its course and is now quickly making its way towards the whalers. It's just one big floating ice. It looks like about eight, ten miles long, about five miles wide. It's just one big massive ice flow. Many of the volunteers start packing things up and moving them back onto stronger ice. These types of situations are common when you live in the far north, situations that require the wisdom of the elders. They're the ones who have done this for decades and have seen more in their lifetime than we could possibly imagine. The elders are books of knowledge that are only open to their people. They have seen the ice threaten their catches before. They have seen the ice come in and take the whale back into the sea with it. With the knowledge and experiences of these elders, the whale may be saved. Heavenly Father, we ask you right now to keep that ice, even though it looks threatening, to keep it distant until we are done. Desperate attempts are made to get this whale up on the ice before the swiftly approaching ice pack takes the whale under. We don't see it here, but the moment occurred when the decision was made to cut the whale in half. After securing the majority of the whale that was still in the water to the ice they were on, they quickly cut the whale in half. While we were butchering the whale, um, I come in, man, he was, he was calm, very calm out there. When the captain tell, tell us that we had to cut it in half, so we had no choice. We left the part of the head, so if the weather is shifted and if there's an opening, they're going to go back down there and do the same thing again, cut it all up. We gotta make sure everybody get the whole share. Part of life growing up here. A lot of times we lose the whole wheel. Uh, I'm glad they were alert. By cutting the wheel in half, these whalers were able to assure that at least part of this bowhead would be harvested. 
they would now have to wait for the lead to open and the ice pack to move away from the whale before any more attempts could be made to get the whale up on the ice. With most of the whales still in the sea, the cutters quickly get back to the butchering. When they are through with this whale, the only thing that will be left is the head bone and the vertebrae. They will use almost every part of the whale. The stuff is um, liver membrane from a bowhead whale. In fact, the youngest drum maker in Barrow, 17-year-old Edgar Skin, uses part of the whale to make drums for his dance group, the Barrow Dancers. <laughs> It's a timeless tradition that Edgar has turned into a hobby. Not only is Edgar following in the steps of his ancestors, but he is also helping to assure that the art of drum making will never perish from his people. It's easy to see that he takes his work seriously, spending the time to do it right. Okay, I'm about to put this string around in this groove and that the string will be what keeps the uh, cover on and tight. And as I'm pulling it, as I go, just keep making it tighter. It tightens this part so you can get the right sound. It didn't take Edgar long to put the head of the drum on turning and tightening the head so that it matches the sound of the other drums he has made. When he is satisfied with the tension of the drum head, Edgar ties off the sinew and begins trimming the excess membrane so that the drum will look as good as it sounds. It's impressive to witness one of these drums being made, the craftsmanship, patience, and attention to detail. But what's even more impressive is that at one point, an adult or an elder took the time to teach the ways of their people to Edgar so that this knowledge would never get lost in the pages of time. Live the outdoor dream with the new amphibious all-season, all-terrain Argo 8x8 Avenger for up to six passengers. The new all-wheel drive Argo 8x8 Avenger features 25% more power, new steering system, 25% more ground clearance, more leg room, extra padded seating, more capacity, and a lot more. Explore the possibilities and arrange for a free test drive at your local Argo dealer. Hi, Quiana for flying Bering Air. Bering Air flies throughout Northwest Alaska and has hubs in Nome and Kotzebue. Bering Air flies both helicopters and fixed wing aircraft such as our Cessna Caravans, Piper Navajos, Beach King Airs, and our large cargo aircraft, the Kata. Bering Air offers daily scheduled flights and charters throughout Alaska and the Soviet Far East. Bering Air also provides emergency medical flights for Northwest Alaska. For safe and reliable service, fly with Bering Air. In rural Alaska, we depend upon the rivers and the land for our subsistence. We depend upon our past to guide us into the future. We depend on Toyo stove to keep our families warm. They're very efficient over the old type oil stoves that we used to have before. Rural Energy Enterprises offers a wide variety of heating solutions for your home like the Toyo Stove Laser 73 and Godan Oreal. It's so efficient and it keeps our house, you know, nice and cozy. You don't need no electricity. And you can also cook on it. And you can pull the top up and then you can cook on it. And the burner is designed so that it's more efficient than the old type coil burners. They're priced well. You save money on heating fuel. It's a big plus in our village. Rural Energy Enterprises helping Alaskans save energy since 1987. The hunt for the bowhead whale feeds more than just hungry people. The whole process from beginning to end feeds the soul and that's why it's so important to pass on the tradition to the younger people. 
The North Slope Borough School District has recognized the need for the youth to understand and learn their language, especially those who partake in the subsistence lifestyle, and have created a book that not only teaches the youth about subsistence terms and local ocean currents, but does it in both the English and Inupiaq languages. It's called Agavik Sirunikun. And the concept was developed by Jenna Hacharik, who is the bilingual coordinator for, for the district. And she came to me wanting the, the students to know wind directions, current directions, um, weather terminology, all in Inupiaq. So, so from her ideas, I then sat down and, and came up with images and we kind of bounced ideas back and forth off of each other. And what we came up with was Inupiaq names for, for the wind directions and current directions, directional terminology, the parts of the, the harpoon, all in Inupiaq. Um, <clears throat> Terminology for, for the umiak, for the, for the skin boat, and also of the whale distribution in, in the communities, you know, which parts of the whale are distributed to whom. And there's also a section for the student to document um, the lead conditions out on the ice. Um, and this is this is to again bring in their their writing skills and their their critical their critical thinking skills. There's also a section a section for the students to to write down the stories that they're here because when you're out on the ice, you're you're with more experienced whalers who have just some incredible stories to share. And so this is a way for them to to use their writing skills and to also you know. Um, record these these stories so they can be remembered and passed on. One particular story that belongs to a whaling captain, Jonathan Aiken Sr., teaches all those who hear it about the power of prayer. It seems that Mr. Aiken and another hunter were out in their umak one season, perched upon a piece of ice hunting walrus. A lone walrus appeared in front of them, lazily floating by, resting. The other hunter raised his gun, but Jonathan, feeling uneasy about this walrus all by itself, asked the other hunter not to shoot. By that time, the other man had already pulled the trigger, delivering a fatal shot to the walrus. Before the two men could even get out of their umiak, the piece of ice they were sitting on was surrounded by a herd of angry walrus. As a walrus approached the hunters, threatening their well-being, the men shot the beast until they reached the last of their ammunition. I'm worth around five saddles. They can shoot them no more. <laughs> but, and, we, and I sit on the boat, on top of the boat, from the boat, and I pray, and I pray, I need help, I need help. But in maybe 15, 15 minutes, the killer haze was coming. One was with a big walrus, big, big killer whale. He bite it and go, go up the water. We, I see the big walrus. Yeah. But some of them was little ones, four of them. But Around us, it's bloody. In front of us, it's bloody. All over. And no more, no more water. What happened next is nothing less than a miracle. Testimony to the connections that these Anubiak people have with their surroundings and with their creator. After the killer whales had chased off the walrus and killed many of the others, the whales then surrounded Jonathan's umiak and guided the two hunters safely away from the ice. And killer, one killer here on, was on the front, and I go, and we were, and the two was in the back, and the two was on the side of us. 
And nobody can touch the net, nobody can do it, the walrus can do it. <laughs> and we go up, fast I go, faster and faster. They were still on the front side and the back. The killer whales steer the Uniac and the hunters towards an approaching boat. As the boats get closer, the whales veer from their sentry positions and disappear into the Chukchi Sea. As for this whale, well, the people are grateful for what they were allowed to get, but the passing ice flow has decided to stay for a while. And that means that these whalers will have to return when the lead goes out. When the gear has been packed away and the area picked up, the tired people return to the shores of Barrow where the captain begins dividing the meat and muktuk up into portions. Uh, right there, that one right there. As the captain starts to delegate portions, the crew's flag is brought in from the ice and a hauler goes out across the shore. Exhausted and hungry, Captain Henry Kignick is relieved of duty by his wife, Juanita, who has no problem getting these tired workers back into high gear. Right there, right there, those ones right there. He's got the mark right here already, so you guys have to take those ones that way. Hey, giving it out to all the, um, all those guys who've been working out there all night. That's what we do for a living. Now it's a hard work, no matter what we go through. Uh, all we do is just divide it, make sure everybody get all the share. At the end of it all, people's names are called, and they choose which pile of muktuk and meat they want by standing next to it. As the night winds down, Henry and his family load their catch into the truck and prepare to call it a day. Waiting patiently until the lead goes out and the remaining whale can be harvested. The following morning, crews have headed back out to the whaling site. The ice has shifted and this small group of whalers is going to try and bring the rest of the whale up on the ice pack. But as unpredictable as nature is, the west winds kick up and force the ice flow back towards the shore, slowly but surely burying the whale again. I want to pin him out. Get down the roof, that's so damn. Where's the hook? We need a hook. With what little time they had, these people managed to get a great deal of muktuk off the whale before the ice stopped all progress. Since the whale belongs to the captain, he or his wife must be called out to the site so that the muktuk can be divided up between those who harvested the whale today. Maybe go, go get those other tools this way. Yeah, in a, make, make a roll like that. Yeah, there you go, like that. Have a man that. Two more. Have a second one more. With such a small group present, the shares will be generous. Oliver! Arvirtit! 
While the action is settling down on the ice, it's just beginning for Henry Kignick and his family. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna be we're gonna be cutting and serving today. Looks like we got oh my auntie's coming in. What we're doing here is we're cooking all the muktuks, making new nalik for a serving. We'll be serving the community tonight or when, the, when we're ready. Everybody come and get a good meal for their bellies. It's very delicious. And uh, this is a serving for tonight that we'll be doing. And uh, after we're done with serving with all this is comes next is the Apuaudi Eskimo picnic, which will be served uh, making up. But here, this is right when they're done with cutting up the whale, they serve right away when we're ready. And it's gonna be a good meal. Come on, come on. It's been said, it takes a village to raise a child. Truth be known, it takes a village working together to survive in the nation's northernmost community. It's the afternoon of June 2nd, 2003. To the people of the far north, it's another day to hunt, another day to feast, another day to carry on the Anupiaq way of life like they did the year before, and the year before that, and the year before that. In 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 the year before that. Heartbeat wishes to thank Haglin Aviation Services Incorporated for making our stories possible. We travel on Haglin Aviation and we thank you for choosing them too. Haglin Aviation has been serving Alaskans in the bush for over 20 years. We fly Haglins all the time. Operating with 29 aircraft at eight stations across Alaska and servicing over 100 destinations daily. Haglin Aviation, your ticket to ride in rural Alaska. Lots of things that make your kids sick you can't do anything about. And then there's one you can. If you can't quit smoking, quit smoking around the kids. Flying in Alaska? Fly Frontier, the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier is expanding again. They've added new routes to Nome, Kotzebue, and the surrounding villages. As you can see, Frontier is now really covering Alaska. So the next time you fly, try Frontier. Frontier offers quick, convenient check-in, low fares, and service direct to many of the villages. Frontier Flying Service is the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Make it your official airline, too. Your Alaska State Troopers remind you that if you're transporting alcohol by common carrier into an area that restricts the sale of alcohol, you must clearly label the package with the words alcoholic beverages and attach an itemized list. Failure to do so is called bootlegging and it's against the law. Anyone with information on bootlegging is asked to call the Alaska State Troopers. Rewards of up to $600 are paid for successful tips. Let's all work together to stop bootlegging in Alaska.
I want to thank everyone in Barrow, Alaska for sharing this fabulous story with us. Barrow whaling crews are known throughout the world and when we were out on the ice there were crews from foreign countries all over the place. But watching it here on Heartbeat Alaska, this is the real thing, the real story from the heart of the people of Ukviavik. God bless you all. We'll see you again next week. Purchase a copy of this program, have your credit card ready, and call 907-563-7440 or mail a check or money order to Jeannie Green Productions, 6250 Tuttle Place, Number 5, Anchorage, Alaska, 99507. I believe the, man, the man's name years and years ago was named Igasak, I believe. Anyway, one of the great old-time whalers from a, two, three generations ago. Anyway, they said, he said that they were, not too many whales were running. It was that time of the year. Anyway, they were out there and had been out there for quite a while. But the crew spotted a whale way, way off to the west. They could just see the sprout, the spout. Could just barely see the whale. And uh, it takes quite a while for the whales to get there to you. But anyway, that old man went up to the front of the boat and just start sitting there. He just sat there and people kind of forgot what was going on. They'd keep an eye for the whale, but the whale, they couldn't see it. He said that they waited and waited and then all of a sudden, the uh, rest of the crew heard a, an explosion. And when they went to go try to help him, he was already being dragged out on the boat. And what he had done was just waited there. And the whale did come up right in front of him. And he took his time and threw his darting gun, which has the harpoon with the float and the line, and, and that, that guy had uh, given it a hard shot, just, just the way that he knew. And he knew he had enough confidence in his skill 
to uh, know that if he could just hold on a while longer, that uh, he wouldn't lose that whale. That's how precious the whales were to them.